Gamar Jova, and welcome to the history of Sacarvelo, Georgia. I am your host, Roberto, and this is episode 4, Origins of Colchis and Iberia. Today, we'll be discussing the formation of, well, Colchis and Iberia. We'll look at these ancient lands before the arrival of the Achaemenids, meet a certain golden man off in Asia Minor, discuss the Greek views of Colchis, and go into the Greek trading towns that figure prominently in Georgian history around this time, thanks to the fact that Greeks, unlike other peoples, had a habit of writing their history down. There's also a lot of small tidbits I found interesting, but didn't really fit into a single episode, if I'm being honest. Now, on to the show. To begin with, we're going to take a look at what sources had to say about ancient Colchis. Colchis often appears in a historical record as either a kingdom or some sort of tribal confederation long before we see anything about the kingdom of Iberia. In some sources, it's noted that the kingdom of Urartu often had to deal with a powerful nation known as Kolha, which we mentioned in episode 3 as the Urartian word for Colchis on its northern borders. We don't really know how Cartvelium Colchis was, but by the 6th century BC, thanks to Jason and the Argonauts and archaeological evidence that has been uncovered, we know that the Colchian coast was dotted with Greek trading colonies, from the Caucasus Mountains all the way down to Trebizond, also known as Trabzon or the Hellenic Trapezunt. Funnily enough, Hippocratic doctors warned the Greek traders against going to Colchis due to the dangerous marshes that contained endemic goiter and malaria. We all know what malaria is. Thank you, mosquitoes. But endemic goiter is less well known. Endemic goiter is not caused by any bacteria or virus that lives in a swamp, but is instead an iodine deficiency disease that enlarges the thyroid in your neck, making it bulge and stop functioning as well. You see, there was extraordinarily little salt in the Colchian territories, and most people get their necessary daily intake of iodine from salt. All this made salt an extremely valuable luxury. I'll talk more about what the Akokians did to get it in an upcoming economics episode. Anyways, these Hippocratic doctors described the Colchians as having an unhealthy squatness and swarthiness. But, in reality, this morbid heat and humidity is one of the things that made Colchis so fertile and prosperous throughout its history, and so attractive to Greek traders and merchants. I'm sad to say that aside from this, little is known about how the people of northern Colchis, Kartvelian, and otherwise, organize their affairs. Since the Greeks were the only ones to write all this down, and they only cared about the southerners they traded with. First, we'll cover what we know about the parts of Colchis controlled by Greeks, especially ports and trading towns and cities, and move on to the rest of the region later. According to Greek and Roman geographers, where the modern city of Sukhumi, Georgia currently stands in the northwest, was the trading city of Dioscurias. Over time, it was known as Sebastopolis, then Sukhumi, before finally setting on its current name of Sukhumi. While historically Georgian and recognized as such by most members of the international community, it is currently claimed and militarily occupied by Russia. Anyway, historians assume that Discorias was a truly cosmopolitan city, as evidenced by belief that one could encounter somewhere between 70 to 300 languages just by walking through the bazaar. That's a rather large amount of spoken languages for one city in my opinion, and just goes on to show how diverse the Caucasus were back in the day. Beyond the scope of this ancient trading port, by the 1st century BC, Colchis in general was divided into Northern Hellenized State and a Southern Tribal Confederation, which was under Persian control for some time. Colchis was variously known as Lazica, Egrisi, and then Amkazeti. Keeping with the theme of ethnic diversity, this Southern Tribal Confederation could have been led by an Abkhaz, Mingrelian, Laz, Svan, or Scythian ruler, or by someone from a now extinct ethnic group. By 500 BC, those Greek port towns that we mentioned earlier became quite prosperous, such as Phasis, which is near today's city of Poti, and was located by a large harbor that has since been silted up. There's also Gienos, which is near Ochamchida, and of course, Great Discurias. These towns had economic and possibly political power over the indigenous inland centers of Rhodopolis, Sikiguji, and Vani, the latter of which was known to the Greeks as Surus. Archaeological evidence only tells us a little about these cities. Discurius is probably either underwater or under Sukumi now. Genos is half buried, 
and Phasis is lost to time. Much of this had to do with the fact that most Colchian cities were built of wood and were destroyed by invaders, including the boss ring king Pharnacus in 49 BC and the Pergamonian king Mithridates in 47 BC. No, not that Mithridates. This is the son of the poison king Mithridates Eupatid. The Mithridates I'm talking about did not rule for long at all. Relations between the Greek colonists, who never really built a state in the Eastern Black Sea, and the Colchians remained relatively peaceful. Except for Discurias, where ethnic tensions frequently boiled over. We know this thanks to 4th century bronze stelas referring to armed forces getting involved in the conflict. These Greek settlements were mostly Miletian, usually with temples dedicated to Apollo, god of the sun. Colchian native cities, such as Vani, were centers for the Colchian elite and were only gradually Hellenized. Vani's main temple was dedicated to Leucothea, the white goddess of the sea, who saved Odysseus from drowning and even had their own oracle. In northern Colchis, there was an independent confederation of tribes that kept their independence and sometimes even their ancient names into the modern day, located in towns inland from the Greek ports. Roughly 10 miles up the Rioni River in today's Polti, there was supposedly a town called Aya. Aya's name may have been derived from the legendary King Aetes. In Homer's work, Aya is Circe's island, and later denoted all of Colchis, or just the ancient holdings of Kutaisi. Another Colchian city is Archaeopolis, which we recognize today as Nokalakevi, which is the site of extensive excavations today. It was locally known as Sikeguji, or the fortress of King Kuji. A third city, near today's Kutaisi, was known as Rhodopolis. In English, this means City of the Rose, and is called Vardes Sike in Georgian. Finally, there's a city in central Colchis dating back to the 8th century BC named Vani, which was a major religious and political site of the area. Today, there's only a small town on top of where it stood. One interesting fact is that no Colchian king ever had a Kartvelian name. Kuji, mentioned previously for his fortress, is believed to have ruled in the 3rd century BC according to Georgian chroniclers. Aetes, legendary king and father of Medea, may possibly be the historical king Kite, a name meaning king of the seas, which may be Abkhaz in origin. Later, in the 2nd and 1st centuries BC, we have Aristarchos and Saulasses, which are Greek and Iranian, respectively. The origins of eastern Georgia, Iberia or Kartlian Kaketia, your choice, are quite obscure. Thanks to early Georgian chronicles, compiled between the 8th and 11th centuries AD, possibly with the aid of earlier records that are now lost to time and oral tradition, we can create a bridge in our narrative from myth, to believable legend, to historical fact. Like the Romans, the Georgians employed their own foundational myth like that of Remus and Romulus in the form of a mythical ancestor named Kartlos, who founded the nation of Kartli, aka Iberia. His sons were Mitzketos, Gardabos, Gakos, Kukos, Gakios, Uplos, Orzirkos, and Javakos, who are all the respective ancestral founders of the cities of Mitzketa, Gardabani, Kakieti, Kukieti, Gakiani, Uplesige, Orzerke, and Javakieti. Kartlos is said to descend from Noah's, yes, of Noah's Ark, great grandson Togarma, according to Georgian chroniclers who lived centuries later in the 11th century, which explains a lot about that little tidbit. Kartlos's brother was Haik, ancestor of the Armenians. Kartlos united all his other brothers and founded the Georgian nation. It's after Alexander the Great's invasion of Persia in the 4th century BC, which caused the freeing of Transcaucasia, do the accounts in the life of Kartli and the conversion of Kartli leave the realms of fantasy in our chronicles? With all that information out of the way, let's return to the broader historical narrative. Having left off with the destruction of the Diawehi Kingdom, we begin with the emergence of the Colchian state and return to our status quo of an almost total lack of information about this time period. As far as we do know, the Colchians disappeared from history around 735 BC, followed closely by the Urartu. The various empires of the 8th century became increasingly fragile around 720 BC when the nomadic Sumerians swept down the coast, passing through Colchis and into Urartu. Around the same time, the Scythians poured through the Daryal Pass into central Georgia 
and down the western coasts of the Caspian Sea into Urartu, along with the Iranians, and possibly even the Circassians and Abkhaz. Their combined attacks devastated all of Transcaucasia and northeast Anatolia, with their armies even reaching Egyptian borders. The Assyrian king, Sargon II, who ruled from 722 until his death in battle in 705 BC, recorded a rout of the Urartu by the Sumerians on the upper Kura River in 720 BC. The Sumerians destroyed the southern region of the emerging Colchian state, causing whole regions to be abandoned as the former residents fled to Syria, Palestine, and even to the borders of Egypt. Some of the Mushki and Tibal people moved northeast into the Pontic regions, eventually making contact with Greek colonists in the 5th century. This exodus out of these regions and into the Pontic caused the kingdom of the Mushki to appear in the west, which was deeply connected with the Phrygian people and reigned as the strongest state out in Asia Minor. Now, things begin to get interesting. This kingdom was ruled by Mitas, who many scholars identified with the legend, wait for it, Dairy King Midas, the man of the Golden Touch. The capital was Gordian, and its people spoke the Phrygian language. This brief ascendancy of a Phrygian Mushki state ended thanks to the involvement of our lovely friends, the Sumerians, who probably allied with King Rusa II of Urartu, who ruled from 685 to 645 BC. Some of the Mushki assimilated with the local Phrygians, while others moved northwest to the region known as Speri, taking with them their Hittite religion and culture. The second half of the 7th century BC was marked by the rising influence of what we know now as the Proto-Georgian tribes. Some of these tribes, who lived in the upper regions of the Cherokee River, were united under the name of the Sasperi, or Speri. They were based in the former territory of the Diawehi and had much of the southern Transcaucasian region under the control by the early 6th century. They contributed to the destruction of the Urartian Empire, only to disintegrate under the expansionist thrust of the Medes in the east. The Sasperi then merged with the Urartians in their lands, which the Soviet historian Melikishvili theorized explains the borrowed Urartian words that made their way into the Georgian language. In 676 BC, the Sumerians, now officially allied with King Rusa II of the now subdued Urartu kingdom, helped destroy King Medus's multinational Phrygian empire in the central and western Anatolia. The city of Gordian was destroyed, and Mita supposedly committed suicide by drinking and drowning himself in bull's blood. Overall, these Mushki are probably not the Mushki thought to be the precursors of the eastern Kartvelians, as their only link is the gods that they worshipped. But it's still a fun story, and it looks like Mitas failed in turning his reign into gold after all. Now, back on over to the edge of the Black Sea. The Sumerian Scythian invasion weakened Urartu, allowing many of the Kartvelian peoples to migrate or expand westwards and northwards for the next three centuries. Some of these groups, such as the Uiteruhi and Kartaza, moved over the Goderzdi Pass towards the Black Sea, driving a wedge between southern and northern Colchis, almost ensuring that the Georgian language would be spoken from the mouth of the Choru River to the juncture of the Kura and Alazani Rivers. Mingrelian was confined to the northwest shore of Georgia, and the Laz in southwest Colchis were cut off from the Mingrelians. By the 3rd century BC, the name Meshki had actually migrated 150 miles northeast from the province of Meshki, which will become the modern Samskhe, to the city of Mitiskieta. This caused the center of Georgia to shift from the mountains between the Choru and Kura rivers to the junction of the Kura and Aragvi rivers that come down the central Caucasian passes, becoming a heavily used crossroad for traders and invaders coming from the north to south and from the east to west. The Diawehi reappeared in Greek records as a Taukoi, but when Herodotus talks about the Kartvelians around 450 BC, he calls them the Sasperi. Such confusion, I know. Herodotus thought the Sasperi were the only significant nation between Colchis and the emerging empire of the Medes. To briefly comment on the Medes, they were a northeastern Iranian people, and while allied with the city of Babylon, destroyed Assyria in 600 BC. They were also allied to the Scythians, and together they conquered Urartu. The Medes were supplanted in 549 BC by Cyrus the Great of Persia, who established the Achaemenid Empire which dominated Anatolia as well as Persia until their defeat at the hands of Alexander the Great in 330 BC. 
Check out The History of Persia by Trevor Coley if you want any more information about Persia. It's who I listen to, and he's a great guy who helped me get started with this podcast. Around this same time, I'm glad to announce that the new kingdom of Colchis was formed in western Georgia, extending from the mouth of the Cherokee River northward, but not quite reaching the Caucasus Mountains. Locally, Colchis was known as the Kingdom of Igresi to eastern Georgians and had its political center on the Rioni River. There are a lot of names to take in, I know, so we're going to slow down and examine some of these names in detail. Let's look at the indigenous names of ancient Colchis. So, if you take a look at the names of places such as San Migrelo, known as Mingrelia, and Igrisi, they both contain the root word Eger. This corresponds to the Mingrelian names of peoples identified by Xenophon and Herodotus as the Marg. Applying the same method to Colchis, we see that the word itself may be derived from the ancient southwest province of Georgia, Kola, which is today Gurle, Turkey, with the Urartu suffix hai, which means people. So Kolkis derives from Kolha, which means Kol people. Another Kartvelian group mentioned by the Roman writers when Colchis became known as Lazika are the Laz. Laz derives from the Svan word Lazan, meaning country of the Zan, the Laz. Phew, I really love my tangents. Back to the main storyline. Early in the 6th century, as I mentioned earlier, the Urartian Empire fell to the Medes, Scythians, and Sisperi, with the Median Empire replacing it as a principal political power in Asia Minor. The destruction of Assyria, Urartu, and not long afterwards of Media itself created a fluid situation in which tribes of various language groups migrated and settled new areas that proved to be a relatively permanent homes. A great example of this is the Armenians. The Armenian tribes moved eastward and occupied the lands to the west of Lake Van and to the south of modern-day Mush. The Urartians called this land Arme or Armeni, which may be the origin for the name of the Armenians today. Sometime in the 6th and 5th centuries BC, some Georgian-speaking tribes, most likely the Mushki and Tibol, made their way to the northeast and settled in the Kura Valley where they formed the center of the Iberian or East Georgian nation. This migration was quite violent, thanks to the huge amount of warrior graves uncovered during this period, showing the supremacy of the Iberians over the Scythians, Sumerians, and other Indo-European invaders of the Kura Valley, which was not one without a struggle. These Iberians lived in towns like Ublitsike, which is near Stalin's hometown of Gori, but later on moved to Mitzketa on the Kura River. Mitesketa was defended by the fortresses of Armazi and Sevsamora, located on Mount Bagenetti and the Aragvi River, respectively. I'm going to end our narrative here, near the start of the Achaemenid rules of parts of Iberia and southern Colchis, and its vassalization of northern Colchis. I was hoping to get it all condensed down to one episode, but I wouldn't be doing the Achaemenids justice if I didn't take more time, and give myself way less to do. These last two weeks were intense with reading, note-taking, and I already had to postpone this episode a few days because of life events. If we're not on any service, let me know, and I'll try my darndest to get put on there already. Some services need to be paid to get full access to, so forgive me if I get, get on them straight away. I'm still learning the ins and outs of podcasting, and it's much more difficult than it seems. If you do have anything you want to say, feel free to look us up on Facebook and Instagram as The History of Sacadevelo, Georgia, on Twitter at History underscore Georgia, on our website at historyofsacadvelo.com, or on our email at thehistoryofsacadvelogeorgia at gmail.com. Sacadvelo is spelled S-A-Q-A-R-T-V-E-L-O. Madlaba danak famdis. And thank you for listening to the History of Sacadvelo, Georgia. See you next time. <laughs> Tu